welcome to a Rice University podcast. For more information about us, please visit our website at www.rice.edu. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Scientia, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Jim Pomerantz, professor of psychology at Rice and past director of uh, the Scientia Institute. Uh, filling in today for, Su for Susan McIntosh, who is the actual director of Scientia, but who's on an archaeological dig in Africa and so couldn't be with us today. This is our fourth lecture of the academic year on our series that we hope and expect you will find memorable, if only because it's on the topic of memory. Uh, thanks for your forbearance with the delay in beginning today's colloquium. As most of you know, the university has just held a memorial service for one of its longest standing and most admired faculty members in Alan Chapman, a professor of mechanical engineering and former dean of the institution. So out of respect for Alan and out of respect for all of those who wanted to attend both that memorial service and today's lecture, we pushed our start back by 30 minutes. We are extremely fortunate to have today one of the country's leading experts in neurology and memory, namely Dr. Rochelle Duty, and it will be my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Duty in just a moment. I wanted to say that our theme of memory was chosen this year for a variety of reasons, but perhaps most importantly for its ability to draw together people from a wide variety of disciplines, stretching not only across the uh, sciences and the humanities, but to other areas as well, including, uh, including medicine. Our program statement notes that the human memory is dazzling in its varieties and complexities. The faculty by which memories are formed and accessed in the brain has a material biochemical basis, but the human brain is a complex tapestry of sensory, emotional, and symbolic elements. Unraveling in its function is thus a major challenge, and that's the uh, way in which we'll be uh, headed this afternoon with uh, Dr. Duty's talk. Those of you who were fortunate enough to be in this room during the past semester were treated to a great series of talks, starting with Jim Gamal from Microsoft, talking about his uh, digital bits, Jess Logan, who I think is here today from the psychology department, talking about aging and memory. Jess was the one who gave us the advice, caffeine and post-it notes. <laughs> then we heard from Eric Kandel, the Nobel laureate on uh, long-term memory storage, and from Sarah Costello in art history. Uh, I think that gives you an indication of the range of this to uh, topic. If you missed any of those talks but want to catch them again, they are all available for webcasting on the Sancha website, so do check that out. Uh, following Dr. Duty's talk today, we have three more talks planned. On February 19th, we'll hear Jeff Bowker um, from Santa Clara College talking about the forgotten frontier, memory and oblivion in a digital age and then two other talks coming up, one in March and one in April. You can read about those on the website or on our program card. So in short, it appears that this is going to be another uh, memorable and exciting, uh, sorry, Steve. Wonder, I, have, I have a worse one coming up shortly, uh, coming up uh, uh, this, this spring. Um, so we're fortunate uh, to have, uh, in addition to Dr. Duty, two panelists who will be uh, uh, speaking and commenting on uh, Rochelle Duty's talk. The, well, first will be Terence Duty. <laughs> He's going to say something about double duty, but I think uh, <laughs> out of respect for Steve, I will not go down that road. Uh, but Terry Duty is well known to almost everybody on this campus uh, as the uh, professor of English. He received his PhD from Cornell in 1970, he came straight here as fast as he could, teaches courses on modernism, the novel, and contemporary literature, and is the director of undergraduate studies in that department. He's won the George R. Brown Teaching Awards in 2002-2003, was the Seraphim Distinguished Teaching Professor at Rice. His publications have focused on the novel and on contemporary poetry, but he's also written in other publications, including the Rice Design Alliance's magazine site. Uh, our other panelists will be Professor Sidney Lamb from Linguistics Department, who is the Alan Cullen Arnold Professor Emeritus. He earned his PhD from Berkeley and has taught both at Berkeley and at Yale before coming to Rice. Uh, his early research focused on North uh, American Indian languages, historical linguistics, and computational linguistics, and interestingly, on the design of associative memory hardware for microcomputers. His more recent work is uh, available in his 1999 book, the Pathways of the Brain, which develops his earlier relational network theory or stratification theory of language uh, and explores its relationship to neurological processes. Uh, 
Uh, before I introduce Rochelle, just note the format. Rochelle will speak for uh, 45 minutes or so, and then our uh, two panelists, uh, Terry Duty is just going to tear into you, Rochelle. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure and Sydney will be uh, kinder, uh, I'm positive. After uh, that, the floor will, the questions will be opened up to the entire floor. Uh, we'll do that for 10, 15 minutes and then adjourn to a wine and cheese reception uh, out in the foyer where we'll have an opportunity to talk with the speaker and with the panelists in a more leisurely uh, setting. So now let me tell you about the important thing, Rochelle Duty. Um, Dr. Duty holds the Effie Marie Kane Chair in Alzheimer's Disease Research and is Professor of Bio in Neurology in the Department of Neurology at Baylor College of Medicine. She received a BA from Rice University and an MD from Baylor College of Medicine and completed her internship and residency and training at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal Neurologic Institute in Montreal, Canada and, uh, of course, at Baylor College of Medicine. She then went on and earned a PhD at Rice University in Cognitive Anthropology. Uh, we try at Scientia to stretch across uh, disciplinary boundaries, and I think uh, you see a great example of that right here. Uh, so at Rice in Anthropology, she studied the brain and language. She has over 100 original articles and other publications to her name, most of which deal with uh, the diagnosis, progression, or treatment of Alzheimer's disease and related disorders that we'll be hearing about today. She's received multiple research grants, including a Zenith Award from the National Alzheimer's Association, conducted numerous clinical trials of Alzheimer's disease therapies. She participates in national and international collaborative efforts, review boards, and advisory boards. Her current research interests include studies to understand and model the progression of Alzheimer's disease, studies of clinical heterogeneity, research and treat development of new medications to treat Alzheimer's. Dr. Duty has served on the Texas Council of Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders, the Board of Directors for the Houston and Southeast Texas chapter of the Alzheimer's Association, and is listed in Best Doctors in America. Uh, so let me close by asking you, as always, to turn off your cell phones, pages, or anything else that make noise, and tune in to Professor Rochelle Duty, whose title is Aspects of Memory. Rochelle Duty. A technology moment as we wire our speaker. Thank you. Is it on? No. Okay. Can everybody hear me? I'll go ahead and try to use, I'm going to look uh, pointedly. Uh, if you can't hear me, let me know, and I'll try to, to raise the volume there. Thank you. So what I challenge myself to do here today is many things. One is to uh, tell you a little bit about how memory is thought of clinically it, within individuals and in the diagnosis of diseases. And secondly, to tell you a little bit about Alzheimer's disease and what's going on in this field and how we're trying to re remediate Alzheimer's disease, which is a major area of interest and activity for me. And then third, to try to raise some points about memory that I have never heard raised in any setting, anywhere, and certainly not clinically. And so um, these are observations that, that have come up over time and that perhaps a group like this can uh, inform a discussion about these issues. So with that, I will begin. Slides. Let me first talk a little bit about normal aging and uh, People worry about aging, they worry about aging of the brain, and they worry about their memory as they age. What do we really know about normal aging? Well, we know that it is associated with some psychomotor slowness. Uh, activities take longer to do. Um, there's a search process that sometimes goes on in looking for specific names, usually proper nouns, the names of people or products, or cities that you visited on your trip to a foreign country. And this is very normal, for better or for worse. This is clearly normal. Um, the phenomenon of what did I come in here for is also normal. People get distracted. People change their patterns of activity and what they focus on. The troublesome signs are when people are repetitive and not just for emphasis. Some people are repetitive their whole lives. Some people develop repetitiveness, especially teachers um, and parents. Uh, but 
repetitiveness that's not for emphasis that comes on new with aging is probably a source of concern. Not coming up with the words or thoughts or information later on. Most of us, if we block on a name, if we block on a detail, it does come back to us or we can prompt it back to ourselves or someone else can. Um, when somebody doesn't recall conversations or events that took place recently, that's a real cause for concern that is probably pathological. And not realizing there's a memory problem is worth commenting upon just to say that many people who have a real memory problem don't realize it. Now, some people with a real memory problem do realize it. And it used to be said clinically that if they knew they had a memory problem, it wasn't Alzheimer's disease. That's clearly not the case. People may know, they may not know. But if they really don't, you can't take that as denial, a psychological defense, lying, etc. It's really uh, an aspect of the condition. The question arises, can we remediate normal aging? And some people say yes, uh, with cognitive enhancement and the right diet and exercise, these very optimistic people say that you can reverse those trends uh, in, in normal aging and cognition. There's certainly no proof of this and there's certainly no definitive studies underway because a definitive study would have to randomize people to doing these things or not doing these things, keep everything else the same, and follow them for many years. The reason we know so little about normal aging and how it affects cognition is that there are no studies that follow people year after year for decades and really measure what changes in these individuals. Estrogens, uh, particularly perimenopausal estrogen in women, um, perhaps there's something protective there, but it's certainly a negative if it's started too late. And how late is too late? People 65 and older, that's been shown by accident in the Women's Health Initiative memory study when women were randomized to receive estrogen with or without progesterone or not, and they were 65 and older at the time. And those who received estrogen in either form had more cognitive decline and more chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. There is no experimental support for a clinically significant effect of any of these things you read about and hear about in preventing Alzheimer's disease or slowing age-related memory change. I want to show this timeline um, to illustrate an important issue. Many people think of diseases of aging, such as Alzheimer's disease, as something that happens late in life. We're revising that thinking. We now think that uh, the earliest changes, which are shown in the boxes at the top of the slide, the amyloid deposition, the microglial changes that result in neurofibrillary tangles and the plaques and chemical disruptions that occur, we think that this whole process begins in the brain probably in your 20s and 30s. It's a developmental process rather than a, a strictly a disease of old age. And so, what that means for us is that people who have the normal changes of aging may or may not also have Alzheimer's disease developing in their brains. And we don't have the clinical readout yet to separate those among us who have no changes of Alzheimer's disease and those who do. I want to bring the topic up of mild cognitive impairment because this is where the field is moving right now, away from dementia and the late stages of these processes and more toward the earlier stages. Mild cognitive impairment is a set of disorders um, of cognition, memory and thinking that you can discover either through population-based surveys or in clinical settings. And the interesting thing is that they have variable psychometric features. Some people with mild cognitive impairment have no memory problem, whereas others do. The form that includes a memory problem is called amnestic mild cognitive impairment, and it is very likely a transitional state between normal and Alzheimer's disease. So we've been talking about normal cognitive change, we're moving toward Alzheimer's disease. Somewhere in transition, uh, a person becomes symptomatic and likely has amnestic MCI. So how is it determined? Well, uh, the patient and or an informant has to notice a change. 
It's a change in the person's abilities. Secondly, very importantly for today's discussion, you have to demonstrate a disorder of, of delayed verbal memory. Uh, usually, this is done with a recall task. Um, for example, you give someone a paragraph, a story, and you tell them the story, you ask them to immediately repeat it back to you, then you introduce a delay, and you see how many elements of the story they remember. So it's something like uh, Anna Thompson of South Boston had no money to feed her children. You know, she prevailed upon the local police department who took up a collection and, you know, she raised 1575 and, you know, et cetera. So little details and things for you to remember. And you can norm this by age and education and determine how many elements a person should remember. Nonverbal memory, it seems to me, ought to be part of this definition. But believe it or not, this is still under review. Um, in our center, if your nonverbal memory, your ability to remember <coughs> details or design, is impaired one and a half standard deviations from the mean for your age and education, we're going to call that amnestic mild cognitive impairment as well. And we know very well that some people who come in like that will progress to Alzheimer's disease. You also have to demonstrate that there is no second domain of involvement in order to call the person's condition amnestic MCI. So they can't have any problem with keeping track of time, no disorientation, no language problem, no spatial disorientation, et cetera. They can't have any decline in their daily skills. And that becomes a little hard to call because some people will come in with these mild amnestic disorders and they might be a lawyer or a doctor or a professor and they might have developed some adaptations as to what they do to get around it. I want to illustrate that amnestic MCI is probably transitional between normal aging and Alzheimer's disease with just three slides. Um, this one makes the point that in an average normal person, the hippocampus is uh, hardly differentiated from the rest of the brain. In the MCI person, you begin to see it more clearly because there's atrophy. In advanced Alzheimer's disease, there's even more atrophy. So the only point here is this is no absolute test for anything. It's just that there is a gradation. Similarly, with some of the neuropathologic changes of Alzheimer's disease, you may see some uh, tangles in the brain in a person who, who is normal. Um, but amnestic MCI, you see a few more. You see a little more amyloid in the brain. Alzheimer's disease, it's well established with or without symptoms. And then neurofibrillary tangle counts. Again, MCI is intermediate. So that and other information is enough for me to accept that this particular phenomenon of amnestic mild cognitive impairment is probably a transitional state between something normal and something not. Now we want to move all the way to Alzheimer's disease. What is that? It's a syndrome of cognitive and usually functional decline that's treated with medications and support. Now, when you say cognitive, you're referring to memory and other thinking abilities. Um, there was a time when everybody diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease also had functional decline, difficulty carrying out their daily activities like shopping, reading, traveling around. Um, and that has changed. It is now possible to get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and to go on treatment and to live for a period of years without functional decline. And for some people who get Alzheimer's late enough in life, that's really all they need. Um, it is the case that such people have identified themselves politically as the people with Alzheimer's disease, the PWAD. Uh, they organize. They want to serve on boards of Alzheimer's associations. When there's a national meeting, they want representation. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, 10 years from now, most of the people that are designated as having a memory problem will be MCI or quite mild Alzheimer's disease, and we may develop a way for them to stay in that state for a long time or forever. There are variable non-cognitive or behavioral manifestations that may occur with Alzheimer's disease. They're treatable. Um, we don't tolerate psychosis, agitation, depression, sleep disturbance, etc. Those are problems brought about by the disease that can be treated. 
So how is Alzheimer's disease diagnosed? Well, again, abnormal verbal or visual memory. And this time, most anybody would accept a visual memory disorder as part of the definition. At least one second domain, and those are the things I told you before, are spared in mild cognitive impairment. Language, visual perception, orientation, praxis, carrying out skilled motor actions, um, attention, executive function, being able to monitor your own behavior, making good judgments, and having good problem-solving ability, and with or without decline in function. You can't have any systemic disorder causing this problem. You can't have a brain lesion like a brain tumor. So notice the central role of memory in the designation of pathology in these conditions. Now, with due respect to all of the cognitive scientists who have addressed you and will address you, I'm going to say some very simple things about cognitive science representations of memory. And most of this comes from some notes that I jotted some years ago when Endel Tulving was here, and it was probably part of this, this series that he was here. So, you know, there are simple ways that, um, that people have thought about memory and organized it, okay? So one way is a sort of time-based system. There's your sensory memory for the event, um, and then a primary process whereby you access that memory um, and, and, and process it in your brain and then a secondary access to your memory. So there's this time-based system. There's a compartmental system that we actually then uh, turn a timeline into some nouns, okay, into some locations, uh, your immediate memory. So that would be the things you rehearse and you can spit right back. Uh, we often test that medically by having someone do a digit span. We give them a series of numbers and ask them to repeat those numbers and keep going up higher you know, till you get to about 10 numbers, and then you ask them to repeat the numbers backwards. So digit span, forward and reverse. Um, short-term memory, that becomes a compartment, okay? And short-term memory would, would vary in its definition, but it would be memory that um, is for recent things, as opposed to long-term memory, memory for things that are remote. How do you define recent? How do you define remote? That will vary from study to study and um, theory to theory. But the important thing here from a, I guess you'd call it, uh, postmodern perspective is that you've started to make places for memory. Okay? And the first step toward localizing something is creating a place for it. So we've got compartments now. And then uh, Dr. Tolving talked about task-based systems for organizing memory. And this is not complete, but a kind of simple version, that we have um, procedural memory. That's the knowing how to do things, like ride a bike. Okay? And we have the declarative memory, knowing that something. Episodic memory, knowing that you had oatmeal for breakfast. Uh, semantic memory, you know, knowing that... Um, Pigeons and roosters are part of the bird family, okay? And very quickly, people begin to start looking to localize these specific aspects of memory. Uh, we all, the procedural memory uh, is tied with what is implicit. The declarative memory is what is explicit. Uh, storing it leads to anterograde memory. Uh, consolidating it leads to retrograde memory. So this system starts to look a lot more like how people talk in medicine and in deficit analysis studies where you start looking for things to disappear and then you say, well, what's been damaged? And you assume that what disappeared was localized where the damage occurred. I think it is notable that in people with Alzheimer's disease who are defined on the basis of a memory problem, things like knowing how to cross the street seem not to go away. Thankfully, I've never had a patient who walked against the light. Uh, people remember how to ride a bicycle or run on a treadmill. Maybe that says something about these processes and how they're affected in Alzheimer's disease. I'm not sure it says too much about localization. So how do we actually test these memory aspects clinically? 
So immediate memory, you know, on simple tests, it would be how well do they just register the information you ask them to remember. Very often three words. Please remember these words, book, record player, in Austin, Texas. Can you say those back to me? Book, record player, and sometimes people need two or three trials. There's a little difficulty with the registration. Short-term memory for words or objects. I told you some words five or 10 minutes ago, and I asked you to remember them. Do you remember them now? Okay, and you can enhance that testing by giving semantic prompts, telling something about the word. You can enhance that memory by giving phonemic prompts or by giving a list and have people choose the words. All of that tells you a little bit about how bad the problem is. Long-term memory, how do you really rem uh, assess people's memory for past events? That's actually a, quite a bit more difficult. So there are, all, there are all sorts of tests that ask people where were you when Kennedy was shot. And you know these are very cultural and uh, very difficult to, to quantify. The bad news on, on this type of approach to memory is that people don't do so well when they're older as when they're younger. So if you look at uh, this paper from Salter, which just tells you, um, <laughs> maybe we won't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, but I'm wondering why that went away. Oh. OK, well, I won't point at it. Just in case. But you can see that in these cross-sectional studies that look at groups of people in their 20s, 40s, 60s, 80s, um, the scores are lower in the people who are older. And so the norms are basically, um, the tests are basically designed around the 20-year-olds, but people don't score as well. And this is an accepted given in all of medicine. And so people's scores are always assessed relative to age and education norms. And uh, I didn't graph the standard deviations here, although there is a graph in the paper. But they don't, they're not, they don't increase much with age. It's not that some people are getting worse and some people are not. The scores are lower. These are just mean scores by age on different aspects of the memory tests. And I don't know if you can see them all. but. Uh, there's a verbal memory, logical memory, immediate and delayed. Um, paired associates, remembering pairs of words, a little more tricky than single words. Um, remembering faces, immediate and delayed. The, the basic story is the same, that the mean scores in a cross-sectional study are going down. So what are some of the theories distilled into one slide from these esteemed speakers that you've had and will have in the future? Um, they're all kind of similar. Basically, what the theories are is that something to do with the connections between cells, the synaptic connections, is storing the memories, actually creating a location. And whether you're storing the memories in individual neurons or in networks of neurons, um, most of these theories have in common a storage area. So memory is something that you can lose. You can misplace it. It's a thing. There are some theories that talk about creating memories anew, sort of recreating memories, and therefore accounting for some of the source of error, the fact that we don't all remember things the same. I, I love the example that a bunch of children in a family, sometimes they misremember to whom something happened. You know, and I know this happens with my siblings. You know, something happened to one of us, but I think it was me. My brother thinks it was him. You know, so maybe unlikely it happened to both. Um, so engrams, traces, synaptic connections, long-term potentiation has become the sort of electrophysiological, biological locus of these investigations. So you can train um, a series of connections to be preferred or dominant or to retain information in some way. And usually in these theories, there are separate systems for visual and verbal. Are we going to get the other part back? OK, so how do you test any of these theories? Well, you can decide which network of neurons you're looking at and which neurotransmitters they use and give an agent that disrupts the neurotransmission. And you can say, oh, well, you know, we've disrupted long-term potentiation or short-term potentiation or long-term depression, or some other aspect of this electrophysiology. 
Or you can take an animal, poor thing, you know, put in a probe and run it through some tasks and uh, try to show that individual neurons or groups of neurons are more active um, when memory seems to be uh, utilized by the animal. It's all very um, circumstantial. Or you can do deficit analysis, like I mentioned before, where you study people whose brains seem to be in injured in a circumscribed fashion, although not a microscopic one. It has to be visual lesions that are really quite large as far as the brain is concerned. And then you say, well, when we knock out the right thalamus, we see this disturbance in memory. Or when we knock out the left angular gyrus, we see that disturbance in memory. So this is constructing a representation of memory by chipping away at brain function. What are some of the perils of representation? Well, any notion of memory um, becomes localizable in the brain. So even literary ideas of memory, which I imagine we'll hear a little bit about, when somebody learns about memory and remembering and how it influences someone's life through literature, they start to think about, well, where is that localized in the brain? One of the long discussed perils of representation has to do with Western languages and, and the way our languages force us to think. And one of the things that we often do in Western languages is we make things out of ideas. So I'll, I'll, I'll dare one Amerindian example. Um, there are certain languages in which you look at the, at the ocean and you say, waving. But we say, look at all the waves. You know, everything is a thing for us. It's part of our language. Um, in other studies, actually, when I was uh, in graduate school at Rice and, and subsequently, it struck me that there was something a little bit strange about aphasia studies or the studies of impaired language because people thought that language was localized in the brain with a map. And language could be anything from a national tongue to um, a written text. You know, that's what we all call language, and we talk about its localization in the brain. And I think we're um, compounding too many things together. It made more sense to me when people like De Saussure talked about speech or speaking. So we know what speaking is. We know what remembering is. But why do we have to have language localization? Or why do we have to have a memory? That's something that, in a way, has been forced upon us by our languages. And also another peril of representation is that all visual images assume undue importance. So I, I've talked about this before. Uh, apologies to those of you to whom I have. You know, we're a little slanted here. Um, and this is true for most cultures in the modern world that we say crazy things like, let's go see what that tastes like. You know, why are we seeing that? Um, seeing is believing. And in Neurology, um, the last time I spoke in CNC, it was about neuroimaging and some doubts that I have about the whole process because of the way think people are thinking about it. They think they actually see um, somebody being anxious. They see anxiety. Uh, and I don't think you do. You see images, um, and the images you cast into representations. So given that I'm supposed to also talk about Alzheimer's disease, I'm going to shift a little bit into that disease and then come back to the issue of memory. So there are a number of putative risk factors. We all want to know, well, which brains develop those plaques and tangles and which people become symptomatic from them. It, we, we know quite clearly it's possible to develop those plaques and tangles and to die without ever having had the symptoms. That's something called cognitive reserve. Is that located somewhere? Is reserve another fallacy like memory? Or is there something to that? And how can we capitalize on it? So we know that there are various uh, risk factors, including genetic ones. APOE is a lipoprotein, a cholesterol-carrying protein in the blood. And it comes in three types, E2, 3, and 4. You inherit one from each parent. Those of us who have one or more E4s are just more prone to Alzheimer's disease at any given age. That doesn't mean you'll get it. Something about low education or mental stimulation or IQ factors into who becomes symptomatic. 
uh, lots of theories about cholesterol and antioxidants and fish in the diet and red wine and green tea and other factors. Um, but what role these things play, if any, is not clear. It does look like those of us who have elevated blood homocysteine, a normal amino acid in the blood, are more at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease or people whose blood sugar and blood pressure together are high. Menopause seems to promote adverse processes in the brain that make people more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. The driving factor in every population in the world is aging, and all kinds of things happen with aging. Uh, you can pick the lead candidates. It might be something about uh, genetics. It might be a DNA repair. It might be oxidative metabolism. It might be many things. Inflammatory processes that are chronic may also promote Alzheimer's disease. So what are we doing to treat this disease? Well, right now, the marketed therapies are all transmitter-based. So remember the theories of neurotransmission and how they impact thinking and underlie thought processes. The first three, four drugs marketed for Alzheimer's disease were cholinesterase inhibitors. They block the breakdown of acetylcholine and cause it to be more available to the synapse and to the brain in many different ways. So these are drugs like um, Aricept, Exelon, um, Reminil. Memantine or Namenda blocks a different transmitter system. It, it tries to block out the noise of over excitation by glutamate. Okay, do any of these things underlie memory? What is their role in Alzheimer's disease? Less clear, but it's been shown that, that these transmitter systems are not the same. So these therapies are marketed and approved and useful. To summarize their efficacy, they're effective in mild, moderate, and severe Alzheimer's disease. But curiously, they may induce small improvements, although more commonly they stabilize someone's abilities. So the stabilization issue has become very problematic. Most doctors don't know how to see stabilization. Uh, most patients and their families don't really know the time course of Alzheimer's disease. They can't tell if it's been impacted by a treatment. The effects may be quite long-lasting. We see people who stay pretty much in state on a whole battery of psychometric testing for five years or six years or even eight years. I haven't seen anybody more than eight years. But we don't have any cures. We don't have anything that stops the Alzheimer's process or reverses it. For, for fair, fair balance, I want to mention memantine as well in its summary. Um, it slows cognitive and functional loss. And when you add it to ongoing cholinesterase inhibitor treatment, you might even see some improvements for a, for a short time. If you do meta-analyses and look at populations and throw all these drugs together, it still holds up that these, these treatments benefit cognition, function, and behavior and that the uh, profile of that benefit may differ by stage of disease. So what does it take to get a drug approved as an anti-dementia drug? Um, there are draft guidelines that exist in the United States and have existed in the United States since the late 80s as draft guidelines. There are draft guidelines in Europe at the EMEA, in Japan at the Kosecho, and in uh, China with the Chinese Ministry of Health. And all these draft guidelines say the same thing. You have to show benefit on a global measure. Okay? And global measure means something that a clinician can glean from an interaction with the patient, usually with somebody else there to inform. So you get in there in a clinical setting and you say, are they better or worse the same? And you should be able to see something or else you can't get it approved. And secondly, you have to show benefit on a psychometric battery. And by default, there's one battery called the Alzheimer's Disease Assessment Scale Cognitive Subscale that's used by everybody worldwide for regulatory purposes. It has some memory items in it, but it's entirely possible for that scale to change with no changes in the memory items, or for some items to improve and memory items to worsen. So the memory item is you show people words on cards, and you have them repeat them back, and you do it three times, and then later you ask uh, which words, what were the words, 
And then you give them a big stack of cards with the words they saw and the words they didn't see, and you say, which ones did you see? Okay, so this, this is the memory part that goes into the approval of Alzheimer's treatments. The search for new therapies is definitely worth mentioning, so I'll quickly mention a few, especially if there are people in here who work on the science related to this. Um, there are drugs and nutraceuticals being developed based upon epidemiologic observations. Just noting that, for example, um, people whose diets are higher in uh, omega-3 fatty acids or omega-3 versus omega-6 ratios are higher, or people who eat a lot of fish seem to be at reduced risk. These studies never say eating fish prevents Alzheimer's disease, nor can they differentiate delaying the onset versus stopping the disease. They simply can't. The studies are not long enough. Neurotransmitter-based therapies are alive and well. Glial modulating drugs, I'll tell you what that means, as well as amyloid and tau modulating drugs. So I've picked out only studies that are very recent and very timely. Um, ADCS stands for Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, which is an NIH group that I participate in their steering committee, and we look at things that maybe industry doesn't have too much interest in, like DHA uh, in fish oil or homocysteine lowering vitamins. Um, we've also looked at simvastatin, which is a statin drug. There's an industry-sponsored study on it. So simvastatin is Zocor, uh, atorvastatin is Lipitor, and then there are various PPAR gamma agonists or anti-diabetes drugs. So these are all based on those risk factors of what might promote Alzheimer's, well, let's take a treatment for those things and see if it reduces the morbidity or slows the decline of the disease. These are not prevention trials. Just to list them, I won't read them. Every transmitter system that people can identify in the brain is being studied as a potential tool for improving Alzheimer's disease. So all of these different agents that affect these different transmitter systems are actively under development. There are a few that have reached late stages. Zaliprotin is complete now, and um, it is not in the public domain. Same with rosagiline. Often that means they were negative studies. Um, Dimabon is an agent that has transmitter properties and other things as well. There are many such, such uh, agents, but nowadays most of them are studied in models in addition to models of neurotransmitter function, and it turns out they have multiple actions. And like uh, most drugs that we take today, we hone in on those actions that we think are relevant to the condition. I want to say a word about the hall one of the hallmark changes of Alzheimer's, these senile plaques in the brain, I dare not point. Um, aggregates of mostly amyloid protein, but you'll see there are some orange colored spindly cells around the plaque. These are glial cells. And so it raises the possibility that if you could interfere with amyloid metabolism or with glial function, you might do something for Alzheimer's. The glial modulating strategies are just getting up and running, but there are actual clinical trials at our center and elsewhere with some of these. The amyloid that's in those plaques is really a, a long, comes from a long precursor protein, the blue bar. The pink bar within that protein is the beta amyloid that's mostly a accumulated within the plaques. In order to get the pink bar out of the blue bar, you've got to cut it in two spots with a beta secretase enzyme and a gamma secretase enzyme. So everybody's looking for secretase inhibitors as potential treatments for Alzheimer's. If you can't prevent it from being formed, then they're looking for agents to prevent it from aggregating or immunization approaches to clear it out of the brain. Just to list some of these anti-amyloid strategies in our center and elsewhere, we're using antibodies, um, humanized monoclonal antibodies given by IV infusion. And our hope is that they will clear some or a, or a lot of the amyloid out of the brain. Uh, there are anti-aggregation drugs. Uh, the most advanced in testing was Alzamed, which failed earlier this, this past year. The inhibitors I mentioned. This was information that came about from basic research looking for vaccines or immunization strategies for Alzheimer's. Um, the slide on your left shows a lot of amyloid plaques in a transgenic mouse that's engineered to produce human amyloid, to overproduce it. If you vaccinate that mouse when it's young, it produces about 90 
5% less amyloid. If you vaccinate it when it's older, it clears out about 95% of the amyloid. So that's a pretty dramatic effect. The question is, what can it do in humans? And the first immunization study of that, um, that monoclonal antibody given as a vaccine had to be stopped because of some side effects, encephalitis. A uh, couple of patients eventually came to autopsy. They did seem to be clearing amyloid from their brain. And that approach is considered too dangerous, but it has kept alive the idea of passive immunization or monoclonal antibodies, which are safer. This is the other hallmark lesion, the tangles. Uh, just look at the blue words, anti-tau drugs. If you could block the hyperphosphorylation of tau protein, it'd be hard to make neurofibrillary tangles. And so there are a number of agents that have been posited. Of those, really only one is in human clinical trials for this purpose. So what are some of the disconnects in the development of Alzheimer's disease drugs? Well, first of all, we don't have any animal models to replicate AD. Secondly, animal behavioral experiments don't really predict efficacy. This is not a great surprise. Uh, when I first learned what tasks were done in animals to, to emulate memory, um, it's a little disappointing, you know. So if you're using a, a rat, you try to see how well it remembers where a platform is in a tub of water, you know. Um, if you, there's a lot of factors there besides just memory and, you know, memory acuity. E even with uh, primates, you really have to, to simplify the tasks. Another problem is that phase two studies in Alzheimer's disease have become so complex that they may not achieve efficacy, and people are going on to phase three even without that. So what am I leading to? Well, the evolving treatment of Alzheimer's disease, which is a condition defined based upon memory loss, um, is benefiting patients. The treatments, however, may not improve memory scores, and such improvements are not required for approval of a therapy. So we define the disease based on memory loss. The next steps will likely include delay of memory loss as our treatment target. Why don't Alzheimer's drugs improve memory? Well, maybe they're not good enough. Okay, that's, that would be what most basic scientists would say because they have something in their lab that they hope will be. Okay. Um, maybe the notion of memory is flawed. Maybe when you interact with patients, what you see is remembering, and you see people who have varying degrees of difficulty with that. But I seldom see someone who has no remembering. There, there are processes of remembering that go on, but they, but they are impaired. And maybe we're just forcing ourselves into thinking of memory as something that has mass and location and can be quantified when in fact it can't. Uh, so we, we may be flawed in the way we parse and measure memory. So closing thoughts, remembering is an activity that is easily recognized in ourselves and in others. Memory is a construct. Uh, the harder we try to measure it, I think, the more artificial it becomes. So thank you. I'd like to ask all of you to take out a clean sheet of paper and put your books and notes on the floor. It's time for a memory test. <laughs> but before that, we have our two uh, panelists, uh, Terry Duty and Sidney Lamb. I don't know if you've worked out an order between the two of you, but <laughs> we'll let them argue for a little while. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, I was particularly uh, pleased by what Rochelle said about uh, memory as, uh, well, she talked about the perils of representation in her final remarks. Uh, memory, is a, memory is a construct. Uh, I couldn't agree more, and I'd like to elaborate on that a little bit. Um, well, she mentioned how our language works, that we, we have a noun, memory, which, uh, and, and we tend to suppose that behind every noun there's a thing. So because there's a noun memory, we, we suppose that memory must be some kind of a thing. Um, um, it, this kind of thinking is actually reinforced by thinking about computers. 
In computers, uh, it, it makes sense to say that memory is a thing. Your memory of an individual uh, uh, fact or data, when the way it's stored in the computer is it's stored as a little object. Uh, and people tend to uh, think misleadingly that computers are like human brains. You, you know, we have this common uh, metaphor, the electronic brain. And there's even a, uh, a well-regarded book by two well-regarded authors called The Computational Brain. And people tend to think that uh, the human brain must be like a computer. And so if there are memories in a computer, well, maybe there are memories as little things in a brain. And it means that when you remember something, what does that mean? Well. In a computer, what it means is you're retrieving this memory and taking it to somewhere else. Now, where are you taking it? Well, in the computer, you're taking it to the CPU, Central Processing Unit. Now, is there anything like that in the brain? Uh, I don't think so. I think the whole cortex, at least, is, is a Central Processing Unit. Uh, the way I look at memory is it's not something you can retrieve, yet, which means you'd get it from someplace and put it to some, some other place. Uh, to me, uh, remembering something is activating that memory that's in that place in the brain. Well, what is it in the brain? Well, okay, now let's talk about what it might be. Um, it seems to me that, uh, well, Michelle mentioned connections. Uh, I, I think that's absolutely right. The whole thing is about connections and the memory of a, a particular object. Let's say your dog. What is that? Uh, I think it is a very large network. And one of the, uh, I'm going to elaborate a little bit, one of the uh, things uh, also that people um, get misled about a computer is that, uh, you know, when you put something into a computer memory, you can put it anywhere in the memory. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. It's arbitrary. It's in an arbitrary location. Uh, <clears throat> with the brain, it's not like it at all. The dog has uh, your dog. You know, what kind, it, has, it consists of a composite of a, a lot of different kinds of information. Uh, now, the visual information, what your dog looks like. This is a lot of little connections, but in the visual part of your brain, in the occipital lobe. Uh, you have uh, part of the memory of your dog is what, the, what, your, what its barking sounds like. That's auditory information, and it's directly related to the auditory cortex and your temporal lobe. And then it's what your dog's fur feels like when you touch it. That's tactile information, and that's in your parietal lobe. And all of this information, as well as the factual information you have about your dog and events that have occurred um, that involves the hippocampus, all of this is a, a very large network held together by connections. And so what does it mean to, uh, to have a degre degradation of memory? And uh, there are two main kinds of mechanisms, it seems to me, that, uh, well, and, and Rochelle mentioned them. <clears throat> you get this one phenomenon, uh, this short-term memory loss, such as... Uh, uh, what did I come here for? You, you may have heard this story, or maybe you haven't. Uh, they say that when people get older, they think more about the hereafter. You know, the old guy goes to the kitchen to get something, and he gets there, and he says, now, what am I hereafter? <laughs> and the other type of uh, uh, really, well, there are several types, but the other really significant kind of memory loss is uh, when you lose the... Um, um, the name of something. You say, I can't remember what that thing is called, or, or especially you can't remember what that person's name is. Um, now, in terms of a network of connections, we can understand these things in this way. The first type, the short-term memory loss, uh, is a degradation in the ability to form new connections. All of memory is uh, in the connectivity, and so when you lose the ability to form new connections, then, you know, then you get to the kitchen and say, what, what am I here after? Uh, and uh, the other is the weakening of existing, long-established connections. And it's interesting that uh, in that area, the, uh, the type of weakening that uh, occurs most often, or that we notice most, is this inability to remember the name of something. Now, why should that be? Um, I have a theory coming out of my linguistic work. It's, it goes like this. That if you take the, all of this uh, large network, consisting of actually even for your dog, let's say, there'll be thousands of nodes involved. Uh, the, um, 
it, it isn't okay. One of the connections of that network is to the what we can call the auditory image of dog. That is what the word dog sounds like in English. You have to have that to be able to use the word, and that's the what you can't recall. Quote recall unquote. Now what it means is the connection to that is so weak, at least momentarily, that you can't uh, traverse that connection. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention that. Uh, what do we have instead of retrieval? What we have is activating the network. And that doesn't involve moving it to anywhere. It's just, you know, sending activation there. So now, when we think about the auditory image in relation to all of the conceptual and perceptual information about the item, you know, it is not the case that uh, you can divide up this auditory image into parts such that parts, for instance, the D of dog. Maybe that represents the visual information and the awe is the auditory information. And the No, it's nothing like that. It's that the whole thing, dog, taken together, is what represents all of that content. And so, in other words, uh, if you think about it, this means that's a unique connection. It's a single connection and one that can easily, therefore, uh, be lost. If connections in general are being weakened, that one, if it's weakened, well, that's too bad. Whereas um, in other parts, of the network, uh, you're less likely to notice loss of a connection because uh, loss of one connection will be compensated for by the presence of related connections uh, having similar kinds of information. But with that one unique connection, it's, you can't do that. So I'll just conclude by saying it's all in the connectivity. Thank you. Everybody can hear me, I assume? Um, Rochelle and I have talked a lot about the problem of localization at uh, the reifying of the processes or the entire systemic operation of memory because that's uh, something that I can understand and something that literary <laughs> studies deals with and resists. I was So that's where I'm going to start uh, today in my response is I'm really going to talk about Wordsworth and Proust and the notion of how memory works in each of their great autobiographical works, which were absolutely brown, uh, groundbreaking. Um, for literary people, let, let me say a couple of things before I get to those two. The problem of localization is not always, or not even often probably, visual. That in Proust in particular, in the great episodes of the act of the involuntary memory, in remembrance of things past, they're tactile and gustatory. And these bring back the pure past to him uh, that are completely unconscious. D.H. Lawrence would say that the unconscious and memory are bodily functions. They exist in the body rather than the mind. And both Proust and Wordsworth seem to subscribe to that kind of notion that the most powerful memories they have that go into their writing are holistic experiences that are muscular, kinetic, uh, tactile. The most radical thinking about the local is about this issue of localization or representation in memory come in Proust when he says that memories for him exist in things as they existed for druid priests in objects in nature or in statues that the memory was not stored in his mind. Thomas Pynchon believes that and uses that in Gravity's Rainbow. Uh, Virginia Woolf believes that, that the memories exist outside our consciousness and are stimulated by those objects. That's a kind of localization that we'd call probably symbolization, but it puts memory outside of us and gives it a more mysterious uh, quality. This reminded me, I've done a lot of remembering this afternoon, this reminded me <laughs> of a description I have read about that the Greeks' visual figure for memory is that the past is a field that exists in front of them and that the past can always be seen. The future exists behind them and time flows from that unknowable future through consciousness into the visual field in front of us. That strikes me as a very interesting way 
to think about memory in non-traditional ways. I can't think of literary analogs to it, but I think that it's something to, it's one of those ideas to think with that we should all have. In thinking about Proust and Wordsworth, however, the two things that struck me about their sense of um, memory is that they are not remembering things. They are creating memory, in Wordsworth's case, out of a disciplined practice of meditation. It's not Tintern Abbey that he remembers. It's not the difference between what he saw five years ago and what he sees now. What he writes about in the poem is the process that has gone on in those intervening five years when he has meditated on Tintern Abbey and allowed into the process of meditation all of the associations that come philosophically, emotionally, even physically. His famous definition of poetry as emotion recollected in tranquility is not necessarily the emotion that is stimulated by the original experience. It might be an emotion that has nothing to do with the original experience because that origin has been gathered into the whole process of his memory and that the memory, as he defines it, is a work. Not so much an object, but as a working out. For him, of course, and for Proust, of course, because they're writers, that working, like Freud's dream work, is writing. In his great um, breakthrough poem, The Prelude, Wordsworth began it in 1798 uh, and 99, the two-part preludes about, um, 80, I said 89, and, uh, 1789. And it's about 10 or 15 pages long, very raw and very intense. By 1805, he had another version of the prelude, which he never published to anybody. And the prelude as we know it now, which is a long autobiographical poem, modeled on Paradise Lost with this difference. Instead of talking about uh, the national hero of the epic or the mythic hero of the Bible, he's talking about himself and his childhood. And he takes that model, I think, from Protestant confessions and the practice of the 18th century novel. He kept tinkering with the two-part prelude until he died in 1850. So that work of memory went on and on and on and on. And he thought of it as a single holistic process that never had an end. It was a field open before him. He could have kept writing forever. Proust uh, is an example of the same thing. The involuntary memory that is so famous in Proust, dipping the mantle. This is where, this is as far as most people get. It's on about page 50. He did. <laughs> He dips the madeleine in the tea, and it evokes for him an experience from his childhood that he hasn't thought of and that isn't important to him. It is important simply as the pure, involuntary past. And he thinks of it as an experience of his own essence outside time. The other two moments, he remembers how cutlery in a napkin feel and how the cobblestones on the street in Venice feel. Proust's um, Oliver Cherche du Temps Perdu is 3,600 pages long, and those episodes of involuntary memory are about 10 or 12 pages of those 3,600. His, his memory, his investigation and definition of memory is that work that went on and on, even in his, uh, he was very ill with a number of diseases, worked in a cork line room, worked heroically, and the whole work took him about um, nine or 10 years to write the whole thing as he worked constantly. He gets to the end of A La Recherche de Temps Perdu, In Search of Lost Time, which suggests the working, the searching of it, much more so than our Shakespearean title, Remembrance of Things Past, 
which one of his translators used because it seemed more familiar and it's more poetic, remembrance of things past. His search and his research br bring his protagonist to the point after 3,600 pages where Marcel is now prepared to begin the kind of work that Proust has just concluded. So the ongoing project is infinite and it's not tied to things so much, tied to nouns so much as it is tied to the entire process that is the kind of meditation that goes into writing, that's that state of attention. And I think that's what uh, is most valuable to literary definitions of, of memory, that entire process of attention. There are other aspects that I'll go into if anybody's interested, but I think I've said enough. Michelle, would you like to respond to any of these comments before we throw it open to the floor? Steve? Just real, real quickly, you know, thank you both. And uh, the thing I find reassuring in both responses is a focus on process, like remembering, rather than a, f a focus on things. Uh, I think that neuroimaging has, in a way, forced a more connectionistic view, because when you show somebody remembering their dog, all the regions of the brain light up. But I do worry a little bit about connectionism because you're still connecting things. You're still connecting areas. And, you know, activation is a concept I like, but activating the visual cortex and the, you know, that worries me a little bit. I think that reifies things. Um, with respect to literature and memory, again, the process is something um, that you focused on, Terry, that you know, I think is great, but I think you chose the, the greatest examples from literature that are contrary to what most of literature does, which is to present memory as total recall, you know, and then the author remembered, you know, and then he has this extraordinary description of what he remembered, and, you know, it, it trains all of us to think that that's what memory is, to, to remember the sunrise and the temperature and who was where and the colors, and, you know, that's, that's memory, that's recall. So, you know, I think the examples you chose were, were fascinating and, and different. But uh, implicit in Wordsworth is that he might not be talking about the original sunrise, or the weather at Tintern Abbey. You know, he might be talking about something else that he's manufactured. And so that um, he's the basis of so much literary thinking that uh, memory is very creative. M memory may be imagination. Uh, questions open to the floor. Please raise your hands. When you ask the question, wait till you get the microphone. This is being videoed for our webcast, so the, uh, this will help. Okay, I have a question. Uh, can you briefly describe the differences in memory loss associated with Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's disease? Uh -huh, okay. where, where are they similar? Where are they different? Yeah. You know, um, psychometricians do try to differentiate neurodegenerative diseases based upon patterns and profiles of memory. One of the fascinating things about Parkinson's disease, it, which is primarily a motor disorder, it's defined not by memory or cognitive change, but by slowness in, in physical actions or rigidity or um, postural instability or tremor, okay? And then going along with all of that, things may change in the brain, do change in the brain, and things may change in cognition. So there is no clear profile of the memory loss of Parkinson's disease, the memory loss of frontotemporal dementia, the memory loss of Alzheimer's. But you can see some consistent differences. And, and the consistent uh, difference that's, that's more of an art than a science, okay? It's something you might read into the tea leaves in Parkinson's is that it's not so much a loss of recall as it is, um, it, it's promptable, it's much more promptable. It's, it is impaired recall, but less impairment of recognition. So the classic description of such a subcortical memory problem is that if you showed all those words on the card, the person would have trouble telling them back to you, they'd be very slow, 
you'd be wondering to yourself, are they having trouble telling me because they're slow or because they speak in a low voice or because they don't remember. But then when you showed them the whole stack with the words they did see mixed with the words they didn't, they'd do better than an Alzheimer's patient and saying, yes, I saw that one, no, I didn't see that one. So, so more of a, um, they, they talk about it as being a, more of a problem with retrieval than recall. But that is not hard and fast. Um, from a, stat, a practical standpoint, if uh, memory is an artificial construct and measuring it makes it even more so, what uh, better alternatives would you propose to measure that important cognitive function and the drugs that you are testing to stabilize and improve it? Well, I'm not really sure we have to measure cognitive functions. You know, we'll do it for now so long as regulatory authorities require it. And fortunately, we can use wide batteries that can capture improvements, whatever they may come in. But I wonder if we couldn't create some patient-based goal attainment scales, for example. Um, this is what I'm having trouble with, with my Alzheimer's disease. This is what I'd like to do better at and then be able to measure that. And, you know, a more um, person-specific set of goals rather than a cognitive-specific idea about memory. I think something like that is one alternative. There, there are others, but I can imagine many. When you described drugs that had some ability to stabilize a patient, I found myself visioning a decline curve being changed to something like this and wondering if the decline continued at the rate it would have been without the stabilization or whether it fell sharply back to the original curve after the drug lost efficacy? Well, people argue a lot about that. I'll tell you quite honestly that in very few places anywhere in the world do they know because most places don't follow patients longitudinally. It's one of the um, main thrusts of our center that we not only see you and give you a diagnosis, we also provide medical care, which most research centers do not. And we also follow people generally currently or until they die. So we have a sense of what's going on longitudinally, but we don't have a control group, okay? There's nobody who's gonna come to our center and we're gonna say, well, you, we're not gonna put on treatment, but please do come back for these repeated assessments. So in, in medicine and in science, it's uh, taboo to discuss impressions and um, anecdotes. It, when I say that I have patients who've been stable for eight years, most of my colleagues simply would not believe me. And we recently did a, did a program for PBS um, called Healthy Mind, Healthy Body. We did one of the episodes on Alzheimer's and tried to get in, interjected into that viewpoint this idea that you can live for years with Alzheimer's disease with many things going well, okay? Not everything, and you don't get restored to normal. So the, the discourse is very negatively weighted. And so I don't think there's anybody who has graphs that can show you one or the other. The longest double-blind controlled studies are one year. There are now studies that are going out 18 months and more, but all those people are on treatment with new treatments added on top, and we don't know if the new treatments work or not. So we're trying to interpret these lines and these slopes, just like you are. In Europe, the regulatory authorities have said that a carefully designed slopes analysis might not only support the approval of an Alzheimer's drug, but also the um, indication for disease modification. So you're right on to a topic that is very hot, but is unresolved. I have a rather abstract question, um, but it, I would just be interested to see all three of your responses to it, um, because we've been talking a lot about memory as a process, as a work, as Dr. Judy had said. Um, but if we're going to conceive of it in that way, and conceiving as memory as something that is being activated at a present moment, what does this do then to our conceptions of time itself? in the sense that if I recall my dog today in this context, is that the same recall as when I do it the next day in a completely different context? 
So what what exactly, and, and I, I'd just be interested to see from a cognitive science, a linguistic, and then maybe even a literary perspective sure. about what this does to time and whether or not we can say that there are multiple temporalities in that way. Um, yeah, well, right. We do have uh, awareness of time, of course, and there there is a, there's a, there's got to be parts of the cortex that, that deal with that. Now, when you remember your dog, let's say, today, and then you remember it again a week from now, that's going to be different than the one a week from now. It, even if it's a, you know, you try to match the context as much as possible. Because the, the whole uh, network of the brain and every sub-network within it is changing all the time. So when you, uh, just as your dog changes from day to day in usually not perceptible ways, your, uh, it's interesting actually, your uh, conception of your dog changes probably less often than, than the dog itself changes. <laughs> you, you, when you look at your dog, you, you remember also what, when the dog was a little puppy and you remember his whole life cycle and so on. But yeah, it, it changes every, every, and the context will change every more. Uh, every, so this, um, it's a dynamic network. I don't know if that's clear or not. But. I would say that you would yourself would measure the different temporalities by constructing a story, a narrative about why you thought about the dog today in this context, what connection it has to the last time you thought about the dog in a previous context, and the next time you think about the dog, which will spark your story. And then your narrative will connect those three moments. All narratives are in the past, whether they're uh, oral or written, historical or fictional. And so um, I think what you're doing is organizing levels of the past in terms of their proximity, importance, value, recall. Values are important. You know, if, if you remember your dog as a puppy, why? because it's dying now and you want to have that sentimental uh, retrieval or, or, you know, whatever. But I think it, the, the literary answer is you would construct a narrative and you would make that past continuous and meaningful by being continuous. Because the three, uh, if, if you don't, the three memories don't have anything to do with each other as far as you know. I just want to add one thing to that, and that sense of alternative realities, that you know, when people start to have a, a disorder related to Alzheimer's disease, one of the things that often they have difficulty with is estimating time frames. And so, and that could be kind of subtle at the beginning. I, I can say to them, you know, in just in conversation, as I'm kind of exploring how they think in, in our initial talk, you know, and gee, you, you just came back from uh, Spain, when did you go there? And they'll say, oh, last week. And the spouse will look at him and say, what? You know, that was eight months ago. <laughs> and, you know, so their alternative reality does in some way define them and their social situation. And it never, obviously never came up before, as evidenced by the reaction of the person with them. But how they get defined and accepted um, depends in part upon that relationship to time. And so they do, especially as disease advances and, you know, there's more and more difficulty with casting a narrative or however you want to put it about what's been happening in the past, people can really develop an alternative reality. You know, a 90-year-old woman who says, where's my mother? And, uh, you know, if, if somebody's mean enough to say she died, you get a grief response every time that's said. So it, it is something about an alternative reality. I have a two-part question. First, of all the research centers around the world, including their own here in Houston, which one do you think is the most advanced or, or, or actually proceeding on a path that, that is going to be the most productive? And then the second question is, when you know a person who you suspect is having problems with MCI, what's the most, or I should say, the least threatening way 
to cause that person to come in to be evaluated by your center or by some other uh, right. uh, clinic. Yeah. Well, the, the productivity and success of a center depends on the criteria used to judge it. And so many people will, you know, give different choices in answering that question. I really couldn't say, you know, who to you would be the most productive, best center, you know, I, I don't have a way to rank them like that. If you ask me, you know, who's uh, really good at uh, behavioral problems, I, I could do it that way. But, you know, just a whole center and all of its activities in some, you know, most people would judge it based upon the number of NIH dollars they have, but I certainly wouldn't. Okay, so. Uh, I can't answer that, but what do you do if you care about someone who you think has MCI, which chances are better than even that they have Alzheimer's disease and not MCI when they're assessed? Well, you tell them, gee, I've noticed a change in your memory. You should have it checked. You know, that's, it, it's becoming very commonplace. We're, we're starting to have people come in. We need to change the healthcare system in more ways than one, but one of them is that people ought to be able to have it checked when they're, they're concerned about their memory and it ought to be paid for by their insurance. And, uh, you know, you ought to not go bankrupt for providing that service. You know, that all should be in the system. But even now, people can go have their memory checked. Children of Alzheimer's patients come and have their memory checked. And then depending on what we find, we will we'll give them some kind of risk profile. And we'll say, you know, you may want to come back in a year or every other year. Or you may, uh, you may need further testing. Or you should go on treatment. You know, so there's, there's some action to be taken. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, a couple of different aspects. Uh, one is the, the uh, different aspects of memory. Have you ever had uh, anybody or talked, have seen anybody who didn't seem to be physically impaired, uh, whose short term memory was quite ex excellent, but who had lost a procedural memory, say a concert pianist who could no longer play? Yeah, you can see that sort of thing, and often the explanation and the reversal of that is psychological and, and not, in fact, something fixed or disease-related. It can be seen. I, I can't say that I've ever seen anybody with a neurodegenerative disease who presented with a procedural memory problem. But quite often, you know, somebody who's stressed or has a conversion reaction or, you know, something else, depressed or... But you've never seen any physical kind of physical impairment of, of procedural memory, uh, you know, other than... I'm not sure what you mean by physical impairment, but well, I, mean, I think uh, you mean a, a disease associated with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Okay. no not, not alone. All right. Procedural memory can be affected adversely when other things are, too. Uh, the, other, the other issue, is, well, some, but on the other hand, procedural memory can be perfect when, when a person can't remember their own name. Uh, the... Uh, Another aspect of this is whether, uh, I think that it's fairly common symptom with Alzheimer's patients that all of a sudden they will decide that they have to do something. Uh, usually not very clear in their own mind, but there's some sort of anxiety about, about doing something. Uh, I'm only doing this, saying this from some sort of uh, anecdotal evidence having watched an, an Alzheimer patient in action. Uh, and the, is this a memory impairment or is this some other kind of brain functional impairment? Or is that not true, what I said, yeah. uh, assume something that wasn't no, true? No, I've observed the same um, behavior and motivations in people that you have, uh, sometimes Alzheimer's patients, sometimes people with other disturbances. And, you know, I, I try not to think in those terms, is it memory or is it, you know, but if you do, do try to drill down in order to help alleviate the concern, um, you often find that it's misunderstanding of some type. They think someone is waiting for them. They think they're supposed to be at work, although it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Or they had a dream that triggered this thing in the first place. Or they feel an anxiety for whatever reason. It could be biochemical, it could be psychological, and they don't know how to dampen the anxiety. So they think that movement or fleeing in some way is the response. So I think there's a, a lot of different explanations and probably within the same person or across people, they, they all apply and, and many others too. But the behavior looks like that. 
Steve, were, did you have a question? Am I allowed to? I think it was well, yeah. he's, he, he's, more he's held the microphone so many times, you should let him talk. <laughs> oh, you're great, thank you. All right, well, what is so fascinating is that you've all argued that memory, memory is a process. It doesn't exist in any one place, and yet you've also been telling us about the one place that, where it is clearly localized. Something happens in the brain, which is a, a thing, that clearly affects this process by which memory is constructed and recollection occurs. And, and it's just, uh, I guess we're stuck with that, right? that, that out of a thing comes a process that has no yeah. No, all that, all that tells us is that the memory is necessary for this process. It doesn't tell, I mean, the brain, the brain is necessary for this process. It doesn't tell us that the process is in the brain. Well, but it tells us that if there's a problem in the brain, that affects the processing. Right? Yes, and yes. A deficit analysis always tells us that. You know, but it doesn't tell us that the process was wiped out uh, by some specific local yeah, okay. localization. You know, so, so it's just like saying, you know, um, legs are necessary for ambulation but ambulation is not in the legs. Okay. Thank you. On that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Before we thank Rochelle and our two panelists, we want to take a moment for an important announcement from one of Sanchez's CP Snow Fellows. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, one of the things that Sienge is doing this year is running smaller discussion groups in addition to our public lectures. So I just wanted to let you all know, especially if you're all, after Dr. Doody's interjection, going to run out and read all is it how many volumes of Alain Recherche de Son Père are there? Seven. So if you were, did feel like doing that, there actually will be a discussion of Proust and memory on the 1st of February um, in Humanities 118. There'll be further announcement about that, and that will feature Dr. Doody and Dr. Philip Wood from French. Thanks. So let's put our hands together for This program is protected by copyright and may not be redistributed in whole or in part without the express written consent of Rice University Digital Media Services.